This morning, we'd like to begin by reading from Revelation 19. We want to read the first 10 verses, and we're going to break this chapter up into two very uh, clear sections. It's really the chapter of the two suppers, and verses 1 through 10, it's the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, we might say that the first 10 verses is all about joy in heaven. And then verses 11 through 21, we're dealing with judgment on earth, and it's the supper of the great God. So we'll see how we go time-wise, but we may divide this chapter into part one and part two, uh, depending how it goes. But for now, we'll read the first 10 verses and consider the marriage supper of the Lamb and the joy in heaven that is connected with this event. So beginning in verse one, it says, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the, the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word. This chapter, we might say the first six verses at least is what we would say the authentic hallelujah chorus. I know that uh, G.F. Handel, he did his version of the Hallelujah Chorus, but uh, it really is a copy of the original version, which is right here in Revelation chapter 19. And we're left in no doubt as to the reason for this Hallelujah Chorus, and it's to do with the judgment of the great whore, which is somewhat of a surprise in many ways that this would call for such praise from heaven. But God, the master jeweler, is about to display the beauty of the Lamb and his bride against the dark background of the judgment of the great whore. He's reminding us that before this, this marriage of the lamb can take place, this, this whore has to be dealt with. And here, we, we, of course, we've seen that in chapter 17. And here in chapter 19, uh, we see the, the great rejoicing in heaven because of this. And again, we, we think of the Babylonian system, uh, both religious and political, and we, we must, again, get our convictions from Scripture, but just to see from this how hateful to God it must be that it causes an eruption of hallelujahs when this monstrosity is finally destroyed. And so it's good for us to have the same view as God does, to, to get our convictions from the Word of God that this this system, the Babel system, which has kind of permeated through history since Genesis chapter 10, uh, found uh, its expression in various empires, various kingdoms, various religious systems, and yet it's basically such an anti-God system, and uh, it's a rejoicing uh, when that day comes, when it is finally judged. And so, joy in heaven, and we'll think of the marriage of the Lamb. 
And so it says, after these things, of course, after particularly Revelation 17 and Revelation chapter 18, the judgment on Babylon. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. So there's a multitude of voices here. Much people in heaven. By the way, isn't that encouraging? Uh, that there will be much people in heaven. <laughs> uh, sometimes we wonder, you know, it seems today it's it's hard to see anybody saved, but but the bottom line is that there'll be much people in heaven. The gospel indeed will have reaped a mighty harvest and there are much people in heaven. And so they're saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. I want to just kind of camp out on this phrase, hallelujah, for a moment. It's from the Hebrew uh, word it's just kind of transliterated from directly from the hebrew and it, it means praise the lord or praise ye jehovah uh, is the uh, correct uh, rendering of it and uh, it's it's in this particular verse here where it says saying hallelujah uh, i'm told that in the greek it's in the imperative sense and it's an, an exaltation and encouragement for us to praise the lord <laughs> And we need encouragement to praise the Lord. It's good to praise the Lord. And we need to be exalted to be a people of praise. Praise the Lord. Of course, God is praised for both his attributes, who he is, and for his actions, what he has done. And primarily, praise is more connected with what he's done. Uh, but the fact is, you can't hardly separate the two because he has to be who he is to be able to do what he does. And so that in some ways, there's an interconnectivity there. And so we praise him for his attributes, who he is, his actions, what he has indeed done. And so the joy in heaven, as we've said, is set in direct contrast to the misery on earth in the mourning for Babylon's fall in the previous chapter. And also uh, in contrast, not only to the, the judgment on Babylon in the previous chapter and the mourning for it on the earth, but also the second half of this chapter, the judgment that is yet to come when the Lord Jesus comes and at Armageddon uh, basically finishes off all opposition from the sword of his, uh, of the word in his mouth that is going to be really going to be devastating to them. And so it's really kind of set in a beautiful contrast between chapter 18 and then chapter 19, 11 following uh, joy in heaven in contrast to the weeping and wailing that will occur and has occurred at this point on the earth. And of course, uh, when there was a great mourning for Babylon, it wasn't so much their great love for Babylon in chapter 18, at least, but it was the loss of all the benefits she brought. And I want you to just notice that again, as we look back to chapter 18, verse 15, it says, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. So why are they, the merchants weeping and wailing? because they were made rich and the, the source of their revenue has just been defeated and destroyed. And so there's great uh, weeping and wailing because the money source is dried up. And so really it's the benefits they get uh, that they're concerned about and that they're wailing about. Look at verse 19. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, all that had ships, in the sea by reason of her costliness for in one hour she has been made desolate so we saw last time right the the merchants and the mariners are going to be lamenting uh, going to be weeping going to be wailing but it's not because they really loved babylon it's they loved how it made them rich it brought them great wealth so back again to chapter 19 and this exhortation to praise the Lord. And I want to just read a quotation from uh, Mr. Spurgeon. I actually got a couple of amazing quotes from Mr. Spurgeon today, and they're kind of challenging uh, to us in many ways. This one, I think, particularly, because the idea of this praise, we want you to see that it's kind of wholehearted praise that is going on here. This praise ye the Lord. Uh, much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Uh, again, they said, verse three, Alleluia. 
Uh, again, verse 4, uh, it says um, they, the 24 elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And uh, uh, then again, we have um, uh, verse 6, I, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And so you almost can see it's kind of like a crescendo uh, building up to praise him uh, with great energy and with great, great zeal. And so this is what Mr. Spurgeon said, and uh, I really like it. And it's got particular relevance for those of us that remember the Lord on the first day of every week. And it's a challenge to us. He says this, we ought not to worship God in a half-hearted sort of way. As if it were now our duty to bless God, but we felt it to be a weary business. And we would get it through as quickly as we could and have done with it. And the sooner the better. No, no. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Come my heart, wake up and summon all the powers which wait upon thee. And then he says this, mechanical worship is easy, but worthless. Come, rouse yourself, my brother, rouse thyself, O oh, my own soul. I thought that was very, very challenging. And I just thought, what, what an interesting thought. Mechanical worship is easy, but worthless. It's good to examine our own hearts, isn't it? When we come together on the first day of the week, is it not easy to enter into mechanical, half-hearted worship? May God help us to overcome this. And like Spurgeon says, come rouse yourself, my brother. Rouse thyself, O oh my soul. So just an exhortation for all of us. The occupation of heaven's joy is God's glory in dealing so summarily with the great whore. While heaven is filled with great and enthusiastic praise to God, the beast's capital has fallen into silence. And I want you to notice again, chapter 18, verse 22 and 23. Again, we're seeing this contrast. And so uh, it says the in verse 22 of chapter 18, the voice of the of harpers and musicians and of pipe, pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the, the sound of millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. The light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived. So no more at all. Silence and the beast capital. And certainly uh, he talks about the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard no more. So there's just silence. And then we're, we're, we're kind of shifting to this heavenly scene and there's anything but silence. There's there's great noise of praise to God because of what he has done in defeating the Babylonian system once and for all. And so what a, what a wonderful, wonderful contrast it is. And so in, in verse 2, again, God's righteous judgment is brought before us. For true and righteous are his judgments. He judges according to truth and according to righteousness. And of course, we know that the that all judgment ultimately is given unto the Son. And of course, he is the one who is the truth. And he is the one that is righteous in every way. He He's the one that in in him was no sin. He's the perfect savior. So what a perfect judge. True and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and avenged the blood of his uh, servants at her hand. Now, you might wonder, because remember, we, we, we've we made a clear distinction between chapter 17 and chapter 18. The chapter 17 was judgment on the hall, religious Babylon, as it were, the tower. And then we saw chapter 18 was commercial Babylon, which was the city. 
And after these things, after the judgment of both, and we said that it was a three and a half hour, three and a half year difference between the judgment, midpoint of the tribulation, the whore is defeated, end of the tribulation, uh, the uh, the city is destroyed. And so you might wonder why he refers here to, to the judgment, he hath judged the great whore. Uh, why is he going back to chapter 17 rather than chapter 18? And we might say this, that the reason is very simple. And the reason is this, that he is setting in contrast the whore and the bride. That's why he's going back to chapter 17. He wants us to see the contrast. What happened to the whore? She's destroyed. What happens to the bride, the true bride of the lamb? He or she is elevated <laughs> to a glorious position. And so it's it's for this purpose that we're looking primarily at the great whore being judged here. And so he, he talks about the importance of this. Again, we said Babylon's friends mourned her fall, but here God's people celebrate the fall of Babylon. And he says, for he has judged the great war, whore. Now, again, I want to just tie in something here that actually, when you look at scripture, we always talk about the principle of first mention. So it's interesting to know that the first mention of hallelujah in scripture is in Psalm 104 and verse 35. Let's just go look there uh, and we'll find something very interesting uh, because it is in connection with the judgment on the wicked. And so Psalm 104 and verse 35. Now, and again, the King James here, uh, they've translated the word praise ye the Lord, uh, but it's it's the word hallelujah uh, that is in view here. And so it says, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So isn't that interesting that this Hallelujah chorus is perfectly harmonious with the first usage of the word Hallelujah. And it's in connection with God's judgment on the wicked. And let the wicked be no more. The sinners be consumed out of the earth. And here we're seeing the judgment of this wicked whore and the whole Babylonian system that results in this incredible outburst of hallelujahs to the Lord. We also just to mention Darby's translation translates it as hallelujah, Psalm 104.35. But praise ye the Lord is, is just what hallelujah means. And so that's why King James put it that way. So we said, why religious Babylon? Because we're going to contrast the great whore the Holy Spirit wants us to set in contrast the whore with the bride of the Lamb. And of course, the whore is convicted on two points, corrupting the earth with her fornication. Uh, again, um, connected with the idolatry that was in her system was immorality and all that goes along with it. And of course, the spiritual, um, uh, spiritual fornication in the sense of uh, disloyalty to the true Lord uh, causing people to turn away from him and follow this false system. And so she corrupted the earth, earth with her fornication. And then secondly, uh, avenging the blood of his servants at her hand. And if you remember, we said the first half of the tribulation period, the martyrs in the first half will be martyred by the whore of Babylon. It's only the second half when the abomination of desolation is set up that people will lose their lives because of their refusal to take the mark of the beast and to worship his image. The first half, it's because they won't join in with this Babylonian system uh, and they refuse uh, to, to bow down, as it were, to the idolatry of the false church of the last days. Uh, that will be, well, a universal worldwide kind of religion. Uh, we said led by Catholicism, we believe, but not exclusively, bigger than, much bigger than that. And they refuse to bow. And as a result, many will lose their lives and be martyred in that first half. 
uh, it's interesting if you look back at second kings with me just for a moment i want you just to see something here that in the book of second kings uh, when uh, we, we see very similar language connected with the judgment of ahab and jezebel and so uh, second kings 9 and verse 7 notice the language here and thou shalt smite the house of ahab thy master that i may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the lord at the hand of jezebel and so it's interesting that there's a connection here between jezebel's judgment and clearly the language here in revelation 19 and the judgment on the great hall it says hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand and early on in our studies back in the days of revelation chapter 6 we had looked at the the martyrs during the first half of the tribulation period and we noticed that uh, these tribulation martyrs had indeed prayed what we called an imprecatory prayer uh, because again after the church is raptured uh, the saints in the in the tribulation period in one sense are really old testament saints remember this is daniel's 70th week 69 weeks connected with your people israel 70th week and so they're really and they're back very much on old testament ground including these imprecatory prayers so revelation 6 verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of god and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and white robes were given unto every one of them and it said unto them they should rest yet for a little season till their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled so he's saying to them okay you wait until the full in a sense harvest of martyrs comes in which will be the second half of those that will not bow to the image of the beast and, and take his mark uh, after that this vengeance that they're asking for uh, god avenging their blood is is going to come so here we find it god has answered the cry of the tribulation martyrs and has judged the great whore and has also judged commercial babylon as well and so their imprecatory prayer has finally been answered and so verse three and again they said hallelujah and her smoke rose up forever oh. and ever the smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, Ken, let's just think about this smoke rising up forever and ever. If you remember in chapter 18, verse 2, we said that the destruction of Babylon, the capital of the beast, seems to be, even in the millennial kingdom, left in its destructed, destroyed state. So look at verse 2. It says, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So obviously that the devastation of it is, becomes a place where demons that are not, not going to be perhaps thrown into the uh, uh, abyss until at the end of the thousand years, who are waiting there perhaps to assist Satan in his final rebellion, held there it's a hold uh, for them but also it gives us another indication of what the condition of the ruin of commercial babylon will be like because it tells us that her smoke rose up forever and ever and perhaps the the only pollution <laughs> that will be seen in the millennial reign will be the smoke arising from babylon that capital city that was destroyed and it, what a reminder, by the way, to people, this is what happens when you rebel against the Lord, right? I mean, what a graphic reminder for people in the middle. And, and yet, isn't it amazing that even though they will witness this, this area that is going to be left throughout the millennial reign as a perpetual reminder of the judgment of God, 
And yet, as we move through the thousand years, the those that are not going to be saved, won't get saved, uh, they're, they're going to outwardly comply, but inwardly in their hearts, their rebellion is great. And as soon as Lucifer or Satan is loosed, uh, they'll join with him in the final attempt to overthrow God. And so, despite the reminder of divine judgment, they do not change. And of course, we shouldn't be surprised. The evidence for a worldwide flood is everywhere on our planet if you open your eyes. And people still don't take it seriously. The evidence in the Dead Sea area of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah is clearly seen if you have eyes to see it. But majority of people ignore these things. They, they downplay these things. They don't believe those things. And they persist in their rebellion against God. And tragically, even in the millennium, that one place that will be a reminder of man's rebellion will not be sufficient to warn people away from rebellion. But it will be there. And God, again, <laughs> will be perfectly just to judge them because they have had great light, not only Christ living on earth, but evidence of divine judgment as well. And so verse 4, it says, The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. Now, this verse is very significant because... It's the last time in the entire page of Scripture that we read about the 24 elders. Never mentioned again. Now, you might wonder, why are they never mentioned again? Because if we're correct in our assumption that they represent the church in heaven, after this verse, what happens to the church? She becomes the bride, the Lamb's wife. And from now on inward, she's not known by her representative elders, the 24 elders. She is known as the bride. Come and see the bride, the lamb's wife. And so that's why it's the last reference. Because from this point on, after this, these verses, it's going to be the marriage of the lamb is going to take place. No longer seen in her 24 elder representatives, but seen from now on as the bride. So... That's significant in and of itself. And of course, they fell down as well as the four beasts and worshiped God that sat on the throne, joining in, adding their amen. It's true. So be it. You know, kind of, and of course, it's good to add our amen. There's nothing wrong with amen. It's a good thing. I was talking to a brother yesterday and uh, preaching in a place where he feels almost like it's like preaching in a mortuary. That the deadpan face is no response whatsoever. He said, "You preach your heart out, and it's just like it's just like mannequins sat there." <laughs> and uh, we were contrasting that with my experience recently with dear saints from the Caribbean, and they're talking right back to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And there, what a difference! And uh, so here we see this amen, this uh, reverberating from the, the church in heaven and from the fall of living creatures. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. And then a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. So now there's a summons right from the throne itself. Many believe to saints on the earth that are still surviving the tribulation period to swell the anthem of the hallelujah chorus in heaven and to praise our God. And of course, it's good, isn't it? To praise our God, all ye his servants, ye that fear him, both small and great, whatever your station in life, you're never too big to praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to praise him. He is worthy of praise. And so verse six, it says, I heard as it were the voice of great multitude as the voice of many waters. And it was just a, a kind of an overwhelming, deafening sound. And as the voice of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reign. It's like peals of thunder. Just uh, we, we actually were woken up this morning with a thunderstorm coming through our area. And we could hear the peals of thunder. I don't know how far away they were. But we could hear them very clearly. And here we have, uh, as it were, the peals of thunder of the hallelujah chorus in heaven. What a, what a chorus it will be. 
Uh, and again, what is what's their what are they saying? They're 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 praising God, particularly. Notice it says, uh, "For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth," and and this is so significant, isn't it? Omnipotence, all power, and he just destroyed the greatest, as it were, expression of man's power on the earth in the Babylonian kingdom, the kingdom of the beast. Remember, remember, people were saying, "Who, who, who can make war against the beast?" Well, the Lord omnipotent can do it and not only do it he can crush babylon like you crushing a bug no problem for him at all not a difficulty and so it says the lord god omnipotent reigneth and the idea is this that the all opposition is all about finished because when christ comes in the second half of the chapter all further resistance is going to be completely uh, done away with and the time of him reigning is about to begin and so in anticipation of that, uh, in celebration of the destruction of Babylon, there's this massive outburst of hallelujahs for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. The once mighty Babylon, the both the whore and the city that seemed so powerful, so almost unassailable, has been crushed by the Lord God omnipotent. And now he's about to reign uncontested on planet earth and so we're introduced now in verse 7 it says let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready here we're introduced to the next step in god's program babylon is destroyed the kingdom is about to be established, and the moment has arrived for the greatest of earth's joys, a marriage followed by a marriage feast. And of course, we must make a distinction between the marriage and the marriage feast. They're distinct and yet very related events. The center of attraction, by the way, usually in a wedding, all eyes are usually on the bride but not in this case. In this case, all eyes are on the Lamb. Because remember remember that great, great hymn we often sing, the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. <laughs> and, and so the Lamb is the center of attraction here. Yes, we're, we're going to be looking at the bride. We're going to be learning about the bride. But, um, but the Lamb is the one who is the center of heaven's affections and heaven's worship and adoration. The lamb is the center. The one who suffered and died to accomplish redemption and to gain a bride. This is part of the joy that was set before him when he endured the cross, the anticipation of this day when he would take his bride. And you can imagine what joy it will be to him on that day when he finally takes his bride to himself. And so the wedding ceremony is the moment long anticipated back in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5 and verse 27. Well, well, we'll break in a bit earlier. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the moment when he presents to himself that glorious church, his bride. So this is the, the moment that has been anticipated in these scriptures. We believe that it will be preceded by the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So after the church is raptured, there will be the evaluation of the saints and the, the, the time when she's judged concerning her service. And then as a result of that, then it will be followed by the wedding. So the life of, and service of believers will be assessed with a view to a 
approval and acceptance, right? He, he, he will, every man will find his praise of God. He's looking for things to reward us for. Cup of cold water given in his name will not in no wise lose its reward. And those things that were done that are wood, hay, and stubble, it won't be a problem for us in the sense that we, in our completely redeemed condition, we will completely agree with the Lord and we'll say, yes, Lord, burn it up. It was just the flesh, burn it up. But that which was done in the power of the Holy Spirit in dependence on him will survive the fire and will be that gold, silver, precious stones. And of course, will be very significant. So he says in verse eight, to her was granted. Of course, the making herself ready was to do with the judgment seat. Uh, he has granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, this is a very, very interesting verse, because in one sense, we've often said, well, we don't have any righteousness of our own. And the whole message of the gospel is that we have put to our account God's righteousness. But actually, in this verse, it actually really is talking about the righteousnesses of the saints. And so the bride, having made herself ready by the donning of her bridal dress, arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, this is the righteousness of saints, or literally the righteous acts of the saints. The robe she wears is the re result of, of her own actions on the earth. The judgment seat of Christ is already passed. The outcome is apparent in this glorious dress, weaved by works on earth, deeds done in the body. And so in a sense, we might say this, that right now, what we're doing in our service for the Lord is we're preparing our garments for the wedding day. We're getting our dress ready. <laughs> and, and it will be revealed on that day. Of course, we won't be able to claim any merit for it because everything we owe to the riches of his grace, don't we? We realize it's all of grace. Uh, all the working of his blessed spirit in our lives when we have yielded to him is going to produce this beautiful garment. But it's good to remind ourselves we're getting ready for the wedding. <laughs> we're getting ready right now. So so are we, are we preparing ourselves in an appropriate way? Now, I want to look at the cultural background of the Jewish marriage uh, for a moment, because there the are three main elements of marriage in Israel. There's the marriage contract, which is what we call the betrothal. It was legally binding, this marriage contract. Couldn't be broken. They were legally binding. And so uh, let's just look at an example of, of how this worked in Israel. Look at Matthew chapter 1, this legally binding contract. Matthew's gospel chapter 1. And I know you're familiar with this, but it's, it's very interesting to see um, what, this, what this betrothal really meant. Matthew 1, we'll break in at verse 18. And so it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Okay, so that's the betrothal. She's betrothed to Joseph. They've entered into a legal contract for marriage before they came together. So that there's been no consummation whatsoever. They all all right now is this betrothal. Uh, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. And again, uh, infidelity during the betrothal period uh, could result in legitimate putting away or, or divorce because the contract had been broken. And he's mindful to put her away. And notice it says in verse 19, Joseph, her husband. Now, again, the ceremony hasn't taken place at all they're not actually as far as taking the vows it hasn't happened but the betrothal was so binding that it's almost as if they're really married already and so it talks about joseph her husband even though they've not actually had their wedding day yet they're just betrothed put her away privately but while he thought on these things behold the angel of the lord appeared unto him 
in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife. Right? Again, this is so legally binding, they're actually using the term husband and wife. But that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. She shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin... Uh, so on and so forth. Now, notice verse 24, and Joseph being raised from sleep, as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So then, so there's actually the marriage of Joseph and Mary, even though she's expecting uh, a child as a result from the Holy Ghost. And there, there's no consummation even until after Jesus was born, and then they resumed what we would say was normal marital relationships. So I say all that to say this. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 11. In our current condition, we have entered into a legally binding contract, and we have been espoused to one husband, even Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may, may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So first part of the wedding uh, or the marriage was the marriage contract betrothed. That happened the day we were saved. In a sense, we said to the Lord Jesus, I do. <laughs> Where we, we agreed to this marriage. We uh, we trusted in him as our savior. We became as it were, connected to him and espoused to him as to one husband. And then comes the marriage ceremony. The young man would say to his father, fetch me my bride to whom I am espoused and present her to me. And the ceremony took place in the father's house. This was the traditional place for the actual marriage ceremony. Notice again in John chapter 14, again, we're all familiar with this. We're just looking at the cultural background to this Jewish wedding and applying it in a sense to these truths that we hold so dearly. He says in, he says in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, and of course, usually after the betrothal, what would happen was that there would be, there would be a, a part of the father's house that would be fixed up um, as the place for the the bride and they would move into that father's house and so many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you if i go and prepare a place for you i will want, come again and receive you to myself that where i am there ye may be also so the ceremony takes place in the father's house that's the presentation that we saw in ephesians chapter 5 where he presents to himself this glorious church. And so it's the wedding ceremony, the marriage ceremony. And then the final part of this three-part Jewish wedding was the marriage celebration. The, the newly married couple would come out of the father's house into a, a place prior arranged. It could often be a place outside the father's house that was a suitable courtyard or whatever. And they would invite their friends to come and celebrate the marriage supper or the marriage feast. We would compare it today to a wedding reception. Unlike our culture, it sometimes would not happen immediately. It might take place several days later. Bridegroom would joyfully display his bride and they would rejoice together. The friends of the bridegroom and the bride and the groom would all rejoice together. Now, again, look at John's Gospel, chapter 3. And again, it will throw some light on what we're saying here. We will get married in heaven. I believe we'll come out of heaven with the Lord to the earth. And I believe the marriage supper will actually take place on the earth. And all the friends of the bridegroom will be invited. We'll explain more why we believe that in a little while. But I want you just for now to just see this. Um, John 3, verse 29. We read this. It says, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. 
This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So John didn't see himself as the bride. He saw himself as the friend of the bridegroom. And so I do believe that at this marriage supper of the Lamb, there will be all of those Old Testament saints, of which John the Baptist was one, even the saints prior to Israel as a nation, the uh, the, the, the saints uh, like Enoch and uh, Mephibosheth and all of those uh, older saints, they'll all come together and that marvelous event, they'll witness the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so it'll be a wonderful, wonderful feast. Now, again, we want to say this, the marriage of the Lamb should be kept separate in our minds to God's relationship with Israel. Israel is known in scripture as the wife of Jehovah, not the bride of the lamb. And if you look back to Isaiah, just a couple of scriptures that will verify this. Uh, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 54 in verse 15, uh, we read this. It says, behold, they shall surely gather together, but not that's verse 5 i apologize 54 verse 5 for thy maker is thine husband the lord of hosts is his name and the redeemer the holy one of israel the god of the whole earth shall he be called so notice that thy maker is thy husband speaking of course of the nation of israel look at jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14 Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. So again, the Lord, the Lord is uh, in the Old Testament, Jehovah of the Old Testament is already married to Israel. So this marriage of the Lamb hasn't happened yet. The marriage of Jehovah to Israel has already taken place. He, he, he says it very clearly, I'm married to you. So nowhere in scripture is Israel stated to be the bride of the Lamb. In fact, while the Lamb has been anticipated since the dawn of history, the Eternal Son assumed the character of the Lamb at his incarnation. Right, So we believe in the Eternal Sonship of Christ, but he actually assumed the character of the Lamb when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea at his incarnation. And so the bride must consist of those that have come to know him since his incarnation. And that is what we call the church, which is his body. And so this will be the bride. And what a wonderful thing it is. And of course, can you imagine that celebration? Can you imagine? Uh, you remember he says that uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are all going to come together in the kingdom of God and celebrate. And this this will be the celebration. It's actually going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. The patriarchs, the, the great heroes of the Old Testament, all will be there. And they will all share in the joy of the bride and the bridegroom. And so he says, uh, again, back in our passage, uh, chapter 19, verse 9, he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I like this because there's a certain sense in which it almost seems too good to be true. Right? I mean, to think of us now and then think of us in a coming day that we're actually going to be the bride of the Lamb. And we're going to be, in a sense, at this great feast, this, this marriage feast, and all the Old Testament, all the heroes that we've read about, we're all going to be there witnessing and sharing in our joy. And you almost think, you have to pinch yourself to believe, is this really true? And that's why he says here, these are the true sayings of God. You can, you can believe on this. You can, this is guaranteed. This is, this is God who is true saying this, and it's absolutely trustworthy. Now, we, we mentioned that we believe the marriage um, ceremony takes place in the father's house, but the marriage supper 
is most likely going to take place on the earth. And the reason for that statement is simply this. The Beatitude, verse 9, he wrote to me, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When you look at the seven Beatitudes, invariably they're connected to the earth. And, and so it's, you know, blessed are those that read this book. Well, where do we do that? We do it on the earth. Um, let's just look at a few of them. We'll just see that it seems invariably they're all connected to the earth. These these happinesses, blessedness, how, how to be congratulated are those. Uh, chapter 14, verse 13. He said, write a voice from heaven saying to the right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, where do they do their dying? <laughs> it's on earth. Uh Yea, the spirit, they may rest for their labors. So uh, chapter 16, verse 15, uh, we read again, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they shall see his shame. Uh, chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed is the holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Well, where's the resurrection going to take place? On earth. And so just get this idea that it's they always seem to be linked to the earth. And so the call to the marriage supper, it would seem, would be to an event that will take place on the earth. Them that are bidden are those responding, uh, who have responded to the gospel in different ages through the tribulation period, the Old Testament saints, the friend of the bridegroom. They will all be gathered together. What a festal gathering this will be uh, when the saints of all the ages and the expectation of the ages are realized in the shared joy of Christ and his bride at the marriage supper. And in the Jewish culture, the marriage supper was the best banquet or party anyone knew. It usually was a very special and joyful occasion. And so it was always an occasion of tremendous joy. And I mentioned uh, to some brethren earlier this morning, but there's a beautiful quote from Mr. Spurgeon. This is the second Spurgeon quote of the day. So this is a bonus, uh, but this is a, a beautiful one. He says, on that day, everyone will see the church for what she really is. The precious bride of Jesus. The bride of Christ is a sort of Cinderella now sitting among the ashes. She's like her Lord, despised and rejected of men. The watchmen smite her and take away her veil from her, but they know her not, even as they knew not her Lord. But when he shall appear, then shall she appear also, and in his glorious manifestation she also shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. Our Cinderella days will soon be over. No longer sitting in the ashes, no longer looked down upon and despised by the ugly sisters of the world. <laughs> we will be glorified with the Lord Jesus. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, just a beautiful scripture uh, that uh, highlights this blessedness that will be ours in a coming day. Uh, second epistle to the Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day to be admired, no longer despised, but admired because of our placement as the bride of Christ. And so we find an interesting uh, verse in verse 10 to kind of conclude our thoughts this morning. I fell at his feet to worship him. Now, who is he worshipping? Well, it's it's an angel. It's the interpreting angel that's been telling him all this information. And notice the response. It says, he said to me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You ask yourself, why should such a godly man as John... <laughs> make such a blunder as this either he was thought uh, the, the angel represented god as he was or maybe he was beside himself with excitement over the glorious consummation that had just been described to him but he's told don't do it no created being whether angel or man should ever be worshipped 
What a contrast this is to the Lord Jesus, who receives the worship of angels. In fact, this commanded uh, Hebrews 1, 6, let all the angels of God worship him. <laughs> Speaking of the Lord Jesus, the one, the only begotten that's come into the world. On the earth, he was worshipped. Uh, let me just show you a couple of examples. And then we're, we're almost finished. Matthew 8 and verse 2, just to see the Lord Jesus was the object of worship and did not reject it. And it says in verse 2 of Matthew 8, Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And of course, Jesus puts forth his hand and heals him. Chapter 14 of Matthew, verse 33. Matthew 14, verse 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the son of god and so lots of other scriptures john 9 38 but the, the one that stands out most in my mind is this here's an angel receiving or attempt uh, john is attempting to worship him and he tells him don't do it don't do it and yet what we read in hebrews 1 6 let all the angels of god worship him final statement testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy any teaching on prophecy that takes our minds and hearts away from him is not being properly communicated because it, this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of the Lord Jesus. It means that prophecy at its very heart is designed to unfold the beauty and loveliness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if we're not doing that, we're failing in our task in prevent, presenting prophecy. It's presenting him in all his beauties because he, all the prophecies really are about him. <laughs> they were all anticipating him, expecting him, uh, but at his first advent and concerning his glorious appearing at his second advent. May God encourage us with a glimpse of him who is altogether lovely, the bridegroom of our hearts. May we indeed be loyal to him today, expectant for that day when the marriage will take place. Amen.